So, hi everybody, and welcome to the Cosmia Book Club, April 2021. Um, and uh, our hour of discussion about this classic book, Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy. Uh, I'll be here for the next hour discussing uh, my thoughts on this book, synthesizing some of the kind of critical analysis of the book that you can find elsewhere. Um, and hopefully you'll join me in the chat um, so we can have a really good conversation about this really fascinating novel and hopefully find some interesting um, thoughts, some interesting ideas that we can all take forward as we, um, as we read the novel in the future. Um, the video of this will be uploaded in kind of better quality. There's some slight editing just for when I cough and sneeze and that kind of thing. Um, in the weeks following this live stream, sometimes it takes me a bit of a bit of time to get around to doing the edit. Um, so if you don't want to watch this live stream version back, which you can still do on our YouTube channel, then there's another option um, if you're just a bit more patient. And if you haven't commented live, then you can um, definitely leave comments and we'll can continue that conversation in on YouTube uh, in the future. So I've got three warnings this time about this book. The first is our traditional spoiler warning. We're going to be talking about what happened in this book. We're going to be talking about the characters in this book. So if you've not read it and you don't want to know and you don't want to think about it, then watch this on catch up when you've read it, if you're spoiler averse. There's also a trigger warning. Uh, a lot of pretty horrible things happen to characters in this story. So I want you to be really aware. I want you to do a bit of reading about this story if you've not about this novel and what happens in it if you've not already, because it might just be a bit um, a bit of a difficult read for people who've got um, lived experience of some of the events of this story. And finally, it's a bit of a content warning. I wasn't really sure going in what kind of novel this was going to be, but it's not a book for kids. So if you are a younger reader or you've got a younger reader you think might be interested. There is bad language, there is violence, there is some pretty horrible stuff that happens, so it's not necessarily the most appropriate for everybody. Right, that's all the disclaimers out of the way. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about a book that is a classic. We haven't done a lot of kind of traditional classics on this stream um, for a few reasons, I think. One of which is that what we're interested in is books that are coming out or have come out quite recently. Um, and also books that I maybe haven't read before. But this is a classic I've never read. It's from a period that I haven't read a lot of, the 1970s. This book was published in 1976. And the author, Marge Piercy, has written 17 novels altogether. Um, and this is one of the classics in genre fiction. She's uh, also written about 20 volumes of poetry, um, a memoir, a really interesting and really um, well-regarded writer who's been doing this a long time, but this was one of the books that kind of pushed her into another level. She's from Detroit, went to University of Michigan and Northwestern, um, and very, very active in feminist, environmental and anti-war causes, none of which I think are a surprise to anybody that has read this story. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna go too much into the biography about Marge, and I, we normally talk a bit more about authors and their real life experience. I think if that's something that you want to get from this, then you should go away and do a bit of that analysis, um, because I think that'll be really interesting for you to find out more. Um, what I want to get into more in this hour is what is this story about and what is it doing? Now, in terms of context, I think um, the 1970s is a very interesting period. Marge Piercy talks about this book being written over about three years, so we're looking at it being written from the kind of early to mid-1970s. This is a period following the 1960s and the explosion of hippie culture, of um, wet, new waves of feminism and thought, thinking about getting back to nature, but also a kind of slight souring of those um, movements after the second summer of love and the kind of violence and the backlash in the 1970s to what the 1960s had represented. So it's a really interesting time for somebody to be writing about the future, and particularly writing about a radical future. 
uh, and that's what this story is kind of doing. Now, one thing that I find fascinating about this novel is what people can bring to it. It's been analysed as a dystopia, as speculative fiction, as realist fiction with fantastic episodes. Um, uh, you can analyse it as a utopia, as, an, as a cli-fi novel. Really broad, which I think is really interesting. Um, so one thing off the... One thing that I'm very aware of is it's very daunting talking about a novel that is a classic. Classics have been analysed, they've been on reading lists, they've been published about. It's a very different thing in my mind to talking about a book that came out this year or last year where, where it's fresh in people's minds. So this is going to be a slightly different book club in that I've got a bit more to go into of what other people have written about it. But I don't want to get too much into the weeds. I also still want this to be my take on the story. I want it to be your take on this story. Because I think that's as valid as what somebody thought in the 1980s or the 90s. There is a benefit here in that there's been a long time, there's been 45 years for Marge Piercy to talk about this story. So we have got a couple of interview quotes that we're going to pull out as we go through, which just might help us illuminate what she was trying to do. And we can have a think about whether she was successful or if she was also doing other things that she wasn't necessarily aware of. The other thing that really leaped out to me at the beginning is that this, this novel is something really interesting that is unlike a lot of science fiction, I think. With some tweaks... And definitely with a modern writing style, this novel could have been published last month. What it's interested in is climate justice. It's interested in the policing of women's bodies. It's interested in um, economic instability and unfairness. It's It's got two or three elements of it which are depressingly as current today as they were when she was writing. And I think that's really interesting. Now, I think the, the writing style is very much of its time, but you could rewrite this this year and it would make all of the end of year book lists in terms of being really interesting and really important. The other thing I want to point out at the beginning is that I made a decision uh, early on in the thinking about how I was going to talk about this story that um, I was going to consider that the all the events of this story are real. I'm going to treat them as real as we come through. Although we'll come back at the end, I think, to whether that's uh, whether that's the best reading or other readings are also interesting. But in terms of how I talk about what happens, I'm going to kind of pretend that um, everything happens in here is real. So a very basic plot reminder. This is spoiler territory, everybody. The plot follows Connie, or Consuela Ramos, and her journey through both her present, which is the new, which is New York of the 1970s, and futures that she can travel to. And what happens is, Connie is someone that's really struggling. She's on the fringes of society. She's been in a mental health institution and has been released, but is struggling to make ends meet. She's really at the kind of at the bottom of society in many ways. And a an act of heroism on her part puts her back in an asylum, as it's called in the novel. As we would say today, kind of mental health hospital or a mental health institution. And in the lead up to this, she discovers that she can communicate with somebody from the future. They've travelled to see her and when then she is in hospital what she figures out is that she can also travel to the future in some way. We'll get onto that when we talk about time travel. When she's in hospital, she eventually is put forward for a radical trial, which is going to impair her mental function. Um, and the story follows that kind of slow edging towards that event. Um, and also following her, exploring more about this kind of futuristic world that she's got access to. I realise as I'm talking about this that the plot is something that's quite difficult to elucidate in, in an easy go. It's not necessarily a plot that is a kind of propulsive one. This novel, for me, is as much a mood as it is anything else. 
Um, there are other kind of plot points we could pull out, but I mean that's the that's the basics of it really. Um, Connie's journey in 1970s from home to um, kicking back against authority when they try to operate on her brain, and in the future, the plot is her learning more about that futuristic world and about how she can make an make changes to it and um and things happen in that futuristic world but not necessarily the same kind of structured journey plot as you might get in 1970s new york so in terms of characters as i mentioned our main character is connie or consuela ramos she is a mexican-american who is living in New York and has had a pretty tough life. And we see the world through Connie's eyes. We don't quite have a, it's not a first person perspective, but it's a third person perspective, which gives a real sense of what she's thinking all the time. So for most of the story, this is her, it's her narrative, it's her journey, it's her experience from her viewpoint. The other, I would say, main character, although I think this this is an interesting question in this story, is Luciente, who is the futuristic person that Connie um, interacts with. Um, We'll talk about person versus him and her a bit later on. And then we've kind of got three um, other constellations of characters that are surrounding Connie at various points. The first one of those is Connie's family, her brother Louis or Louis and her niece Dolly. Um, And in kind of flashback or in her memory, her husband, her daughter, family that have been in her life and mostly taken from her life at various points. We also have a community which is in the mental health institutions. This is um, other inmates, her friends, Sybil and Skip. Um, antagonists, people she just kind of interacts with. Also then the medical staff, the doctors, the nurses. And then that third community are the people that live in the future, the people that live in um, at a poset. Um, so um, not not just Vicente, but Jack Rabbit and B and Barbarossa and all of those. So these three kind of communities that she interacts with at various points and has very different relationships with um, along the way. It's There's a surprisingly rich drawing of characters for me in a novel which is not short, it's not a novella, but it's also, I mean, we're looking at about 400 pages in my edition. It's reasonably big text. Um, there is You get quite a lot of character here. And I suppose this is something that... Um, is really evident from this novel is that it's a character driven piece. I mentioned it's not necessarily a plot driven piece, it's a lot more of a character driven piece. So what you do get is that sense of um, the the people in this story. They're all very richly drawn, they all have their unique characters and their unique interests. And I think that's really interesting. I, I read a review of this that said you can draw all these characters kind of from memory. They all stand out as kind of different personalities, which I think is really clever and really interesting. Okay, and we'll come back to that, I think, when we talk about the themes and about the kind of what occurs to me sections. So I kind of mentioned these communities, and really there are two settings of which we interact with characters for most of the story. The first one of those is in the kind of New York mental... Um, health, hospitals, asylums, community. And there are kind of three hospitals where Connie finds herself where she interacts with some similar, some different people. We've got um, the original um, kind of institution, then we have somewhere in the country, and then we have a more modern hospital in New York itself. Um, These are all different but also similar. They're all kind of variations of the same mean and depressing and prison-like experience. And then we have the future setting, and the main one of those 
is this one village community which is part of a township called the Mouths of the Mataposet, um, which is a um, village community modelled on the ideas of an um, of a Native American um, tribal setup that has been kind of modernised, that lives alongside other villages which have got their own um, kind of uh, historically based cultures. And these are, in my mind, two villages. They both have their own customs, their own power structures, their own rhythms to navigate. And the first one, the mental health system, Connie's at an advantage. She's been through the system once before. And at least in the first two of those three places that she lives, the the initial um, place where she's where she goes to, and then in the country, she understands what to do and how to do it. It's somewhere she's very familiar with. And then the hospital is slightly different. The hospital is somewhere where she's having to learn how to navigate. And then we've got the future village, which has definitely got its own oh, completely to her alien way of thinking and doing and operating. As in traditional with science fiction and fantasy, we see an we see a different kind of community through um, that person's eyes. I think something that's really interesting about this story actually that it occurs to me is that when the novel was published in the 1970s, in some ways the world that it was talking about was not alien to people. It was contemporary society. And the futuristic bit was um, the kind of alien place that we had to learn through Connie's eyes. I think maybe one of the reasons why it has done so well over such a long period of time is that it's written in a way that the historical bit, which to now, now to us is a long time ago, um, is still explained by Connie very effectively, which I think is really good. Um, and I suppose also, uh, well, especially when you look at the acknowledgements, um, Marge Piercy did a lot of research into the mental health um, asylum system um, in America at this time. So she is all, it's almost a piece of reportage. So perhaps that has given it a freshness, which, um, which we kind of, which means that we can hook into this in a way that we maybe wouldn't do otherwise. Last thing I want to say about settings is um, something that I picked up on from a Tor.com article about this book um, by Joe Walton. There are no stories in Utopia, there's just life puttering along. And I think this kind of ties in, I suppose, that initial kind of context for me and the setting. The Utopian side doesn't have lots, doesn't have a, a, a story. The story is Connie's experiences of this Utopia. But to some degree, it is a, a place with without much going on. It's a place where people are, although there is action, people are just kind of living their lives. That The utopia that Marge Piercy has built is one where it's about life's everyday rhythms without a pressure for constant progress. And maybe there's a comment there about what that drive for progress means for contemporary society to us okay that's settings mostly what i want to get into in this is themes and kind of things that occur to me but loads of stuff in here um so if you've got comments on any of this you can put them in the chat wherever you're watching this um, i can put them on the screen then or i can respond to them and we can get into a bit of a dialogue like i say if you're watching this back on youtube or facebook afterwards you can still leave a comment, we'll see it, we'll respond, we can carry on the conversation afterwards. Um, so please feel free. Uh, if you don't want it put on the screen, then just leave a note to say, you know, don't share this on the screen, and that's fine. And I'll see them all here on my little control panel. Okay, so themes. I thought we'd kick off with a big one, which goes back to Cosmia Festival 2019, Utopias and Dystopias. And I think something that we... Um, we looked at at the time with um, with that is that you don't get a lot of um, you don't get a lot of utopias in science fiction. Maybe and maybe we kind of come back to that um, comment from Joe Walton. 
utopias don't tend to have a lot of story. And what usually happens is that um, usually happens is that utopias turn out to be dystopias. We just don't realise that at the start of the story. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts about whether you consider the future that Connie goes through to be a true utopia, or actually it has got things in there that aren't quite right. Because I'm not sure I've entirely got in my head quite how that fits. There's an interesting quote. There was a really nice article that Mar that Marge Piercy wrote for the Guardian to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the book coming out, where she talks about some of these themes, and she said in that article. During the heyday of the second wave of the women's movement, a number of utopias were created, and she kind of lists some examples. And now they aren't. Why? Feminist utopias were created out of a hunger for what we didn't have at a time when change felt not only possible, but probable. Utopias came from the desire to imagine a better society when we dared to do so. And our political energy goes into defending rights and projects we won are created and now under attack, there is far less energy for imagining fully drawn future societies we may wish to live in. So she is very much saying that what she was interested in writing was a utopia. That's what she's trying to do here. She's trying to model something that is... Um, that is a positive future. And I think one, what is really nice about how she's done this is that she's managed to do it in a way that still has a bit of drive. It still has a has an interesting comparison. It It's not about necessarily satirising the present with a with a future, but it's it's a different kind of um, thing. And she says in, in that article, the point of a novel about the future is not to predict it. I'm not pretending to be Nostradamus. The point is to influence the present by showing where you can go. We're not good about predicting the future. The point is to get people to imagine what they want and what they don't want to happen down the road and maybe do something about it. And there's something quite fascinating here um, about um, the, the, the events of the novel. When we look at the residents of the utopia, they've realised they can connect with people over time mentally and then they can do a version of time travel. We're going to talk about motivations later on in this video, but I want you to think about, as I'm kind of building towards that, or as I kind of get to that later, whether we think the residents of that future society are doing this to people in the past. Are they presenting a utopia so that people in the past have got something to aim for? Not necessarily about the technology or about the science, but about saying, listen, if you keep struggling, this is where you can get to. I think Marge is kind of writing this partly in a period where that period of writing about utopias is already starting to erode. The, the kind of protection of what's been gathered is already starting to happen. So is this novel partly a vehicle of saying to people to people involved in the struggle listen this is the kind of thing we can be aiming for keep this in your mind we don't want to go back to where we were we don't want to have that life that connie's living we want to go for this other one in the future keep your energy levels up so there we go now there, there is a question here about whether it is a utopia and also i suppose whether that matters um there's a there's quite a lot on this novel about on Wikipedia, and there were some bits there that I kind of wanted to pull up, I suppose. Um, and the first thing it talks about um, is social transformation. So maybe we're moving here from utopia into some of the facets of what a utopia is or what a utopia wants to do. And I think that there are probably three, three areas of society that she's interested in which the um, which the utopia and the story are looking at. The first one of those, Wikipedia calls social transformation. But I suppose I kind of mean environmental and economic um, changes and kind of climate socialism, I suppose. It's how we look at the res natural resources around us and how we use them and how we do that collectively. 
So that's the first one. I think the second one is about um, fem. Well, Wikipedia says feminism, but I think gender and identity um, is what we probably think about calling it today. And then the third one is about racism and about race in general. And all of these are incredibly resonant for a reader that's looking at this novel in 2021 and all last year. These are um, these are things that we're thinking about all the time as a society, but have kind of come to the surface in the last two or three years, which was thrilling for me reading this, feeling that resonance with what's going on at the moment. So let's start with that kind of political and economic transformation. We'll go in the order of Wikipedia, I suppose. Um, so what we're kind of getting here is um, a social transformation of society after a kind of violent insurrection finally tipped over by environmental degradation and then through to war. And I think the argument that she's making is that um, if there was a core of idealism and energy, people that are looking to um, make a change, and when the moment comes, if they've still got enough faith, they can make it happen. That's my view on, on what's happening here. You might have a different one. Please leave it in the chat. Um, it's the, and the connection between personal action and historical change. And I think considering that Marge Piercy was living in and lived through when she wrote this, uh, a massive period of social um, change and of people advocating for new rights and for new ways of thinking about the world, that makes a lot of sense to me. What we get in this utopia is somewhere where everybody's got a say in how society functions. Everybody has a share of the communal wealth. Um, there's something I suppose I've not talked about that I was going to mention at the beginning, which is the, the palpable anger that you get from this novel. You get an anger about the ways in which society currently functions, and I think it, society functions in some very similar ways now to how it did 45 years ago. Um, and that anger is kind of palpable, the kind of unfairness of society. And I think that that utopia that she's talking about is um, is is the kind of the salving of all the things that make Marge Piercy the most angry. And one of those is about how society is structured so that everybody can contribute, everybody can have a say, everybody can make a difference. Um, so um, I'd love to know what you think about that side of things. The second one, uh, the second that second kind of big theme, which Wikipedia calls feminism, I think is about gender and identity. So PC does talk about the, her future not being a utopia because it's accessible. Um, every idea that's in it was an idea that was in, apart from the abruders, apart from the kind of the birthing pools, everything that they did, apart from some of the technology, was available in the 1970s. Um, and the ideas behind this society are the encapsulating, modelling the ideas of the women's movement in the 1960s and 70s. I think this is a very interesting and very, um, it's, a, it's a take on a, in a, on a futuristic or a speculative world that you don't often get them quite so tied to a political or a social movement. So I think that that makes this novel kind of stand apart from a lot of the other books that we've talked about, just how direct it is. Um, the Wikipedia article suggests that there are counterparts between um, the kind of present world and the, f and the future world. So there is Skip, who's been put in an institution because he's gay, and then Jack Rabbit, who's bisexual and popular. Um, the doctors in Connie's time are men, and in the future, women tend to be the ones who are doing the healing roles. Um, and, those, and the positions of power rotate. There's no traditional parental power, 
um, which when you think about the um, scene with Louis and his children and the way that he is the kind of dominant bullying figure in that scene is really interesting. Um, there is also um, something in this Wikipedia article about how um, the novel looks at the conflict between kind of feminism and commitment to motherhood and how that can be deconstructed and maybe PSE with the Brooders is finding a mechanism which would do that. I think something that's very interesting about this um, Wikipedia view is that it doesn't necessarily um, reflect the novel's doing something more interesting with gender and identity here, I think. Uh, because, and, that, and this is maybe where this mirror, the way I want to deconstruct this mirroring, maybe that's a good way into it. So yes, Skip is um, being sent to a mental institution to essentially try and cure him of his um, sexual orientation. In the future, it's, it's broader than just somebody being bisexual. There kind of almost is no sexuality in that way. There is There are no gender pronouns. These have been replaced by person and per. And this felt very, very contemporary to now in terms of writing for me. Um, I kind of don't want to get too much into the kind of um, the details of all of that because I think there's... There's a lot for you to take from it personally. But I found that a really um, compelling part of the story that it just kind of really wasn't a big deal. And we see it's not a big deal because it's a big deal for Connie. And Connie's resistance to this utopian world is most encapsulated in her resistance to the way that gender and ideas about gender have changed from her time. Going back to that argument that it's about the conflict between commitment to motherhood and feminism, Connie is someone that has defined herself by being a mother and a failure of a mother. And she's kind of on the... She wants to get back to that place where she can feel like a good mother, perhaps. <clears throat> so to move to somewhere where that isn't part of society's makeup is profoundly disconcerting for her. The, uh, there's a couple of other elements here about um, kind of female identity and gender, which I just wanted to pick up on. The first one of those, which is again very relevant for the last kind of year or so, is about women and the policing of their bodies. Um, this is something that has been in the news a lot in the last um, kind of year or two, um, and it's something that kind of Marge kind of talks about in. Um, in some of the writing she does, um, which is looking at the um, looking at the kind of erosion of rights, which um, which you kind of get um, as kind of progress comes, and then it's kind of pushed back from people resistant to change in society. Women's choices about their own bodies is, particularly in Connie's time, is a strand that runs all the way through and about her trying to reclaim um, a say in what she does and how she feels. There's that particularly horrific story about what happens to her when she has an abortion and the just kind of sheer lack of control over even herself. Um, that was incredibly emotive to me and you get that kind of palpable sense of anger, I think, again, coming through. And then the last aspect we touched on a bit already is childbirth. So in this story, if you don't know or can't remember, women don't give birth anymore. There are brooders, which are essentially places where genetic material is mixed and then a baby is grown artificially. And then when born, three mothers of whichever genders want to get involved, then raise the child. They're not necessarily genetically linked. They just look after the child. Now, I think Marge sees this as a quite a controversial part of the story. I wonder whether um, I wonder whether we feel that way quite so much anymore. It felt to me that when when you read it now, that that idea has been perpetuated throughout lots of genre fiction. 
it didn't feel weird to me. It felt like a normal thing. It felt like a just a kind of a, a trope of science fiction. Um, so it's interesting that sh- that um, she still feels that that's controversial. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd love to know if you think that's controversial. Now, um, she did kind of note that if she wrote the novel again, she'd include a group that chose to give birth live, which was what she wanted to do in the original story, but she never put it in because of how long it took and getting all the structure right. And maybe um, it just kind of fell by the wayside as a note. Um, I, I I don't think the novel struggles for that, I, but maybe perhaps in some of the discourses that she wanted the novel to um, start it would have been a useful thing to have as a counterpoint. And what it, I suppose, would have shown is that this utopia in the future, there is always a powerful element of choice. And as long as you don't hurt people, that people are allowed to kind of do what they want to do. As long as it serves the society and it doesn't hurt anybody, people can kind of follow their own story. So the final kind of element of this utopian vision Um, and this utopian society is something that isn't necessarily massively picked up on in quite a lot of the discourse that I've kind of read about this story. It's not necessarily there in lots of interviews, but that's looking at the racism of the story. Um, And this is something that's very palpable in the story itself. Connie is Mexican-American. She talks a lot in the story about how that influences her... um, her experience of the world, how she, how her brother has tried to anglicise himself to kind of get ahead, and how that seems to be working, um, about how she's treated by people, about where she is in the pecking order of any scenario, whether that leads to um, some of the things that happen to her. Um, and I think interesting um, that the utopian society is not is very deliberately tried to remove any risk of racism from the future. And one of the articles I read about the story did kind of pick up on this um, with a contemporary eye. Um, well, one of the factors in that future utopia is that very deliberately, ethnicity has been divorced from genes and skin colour. It's purely aesthetic. So there are communities who are um, based on older societies, Native American, um, what else have we got in there? Um, There's the kind of Harlem, there will be all these kind of various types of what in the novel sometimes are described as primitive societies, but we, you know, earlier societies and particular ones that are, that um, were interested in kind of um, cooperative agriculture-based communities or communes. Something very popular in that period, people looking at societies that do things differently and trying to draw out from them elements that might make our world better. So very of the period, I think. But you get that byproduct where genetic identity has, has gone. And I that was uncomfortable for me I think particularly given recent um, conversations about appropriation about the importance of of heritage do we think that that is utopian do we do, does it matter is it something that is an artifact of the time that if this was a modern novel might think about things slightly differently I'd love to know your thoughts on this it's such a thorny difficult area um, and but one that this story helps us to think about. Okay, let's move off the he- heavy stuff a little bit. This is such a, a dark and heavy novel at times. I think it's easy to really get into those thorny issues. So let's move on to a different one, which is time travel, hopefully a little bit lighter. So this is what Marge had to say in that article in The Guardian. I was weary of affluent white males hogging the genre, this is time travel genre, and I didn't feel they were the sort of visitors I would prefer if I were a future good society. When I was a child, I first noticed that neither history, as I was taught it, nor the stories I was told seemed to lead lead to me. I began to fix them. I've been at it ever since. We need a past that leads to us, 
Similarly, what we imagine we are working towards does a lot to define what we will consider doable action, aiming at producing the future we want and preventing the future we fear. So we'll start with the heavy bit and then we'll get on to the timey-wimey stuff. So um, really interesting take, I think, on you know who gets to be a time traveller. And yes, traditionally, you, it's your kind of male, white, scientists think about the time machine think about fringe think about who those time travelers are coming back in time at least and this is marge saying well actually it's not necessarily about your achievements it's not necessarily about your education it's about it's about being receptiveness anybody can do it and in some ways you kind of want people to go to the future are the ones that need hope the most who who do you want to show a better future to so that they can start to think about it okay that's the heavy stuff let's talk about time wind stuff okay so this version of time travel works as a kind of astral projection there is a there is a mental connection between two people what or one person or or groups of people i should say because there is a there is a moment where there's there's kind of three of them in this mix and when that bond has been made across time then one person kind of travels to the other person's time they manifest themselves and at least in the future um, the person that's traveled to the future is corporeal they can interact with the world they can eat they can drink they can um couple as the novel says with other people but they they don't take on nutrients we don't really get a sense of whether they can die so it's a bit of a kind of interesting um experience i think and i'm not sure it's one that's necessarily logically consistent if people go back in time it's a little bit unclear whether they can be seen or not or interact or not it feels like they can't quite so much um, it, because I think when Luciente goes back, she does kind of I suppose to warm the chair at the very beginning, but then when um, when Connie is escaped from the hospital and she's trying to survive in the wilderness, she's got to go and get her own water and pick her own herbs and stuff. Luciente can't do anything for her, so it's a little bit vague. And maybe not entirely consistent. What I would argue in this story is that it, it doesn't necessarily matter. I think it's sometimes in time travel novels, the fine details, if they're not consistent, they can undermine what the story is doing. Well, but what we should be caring about here is the feelings and the emotions and the experience of doing this, not necessarily um, quite the ins and outs of it this is a speculative novel it's not a hard sci-fi time travel story there is something interesting though about the novel's treatment of science fiction and fantasy uh, uh, sorry, sorry science fiction and time travel what becomes clear quite early on is that what connie is doing is traveling to a version of the future not um not a fixed one um, and we'll talk about that in things that occur but she's traveling to a version of the future and because she's traveling to a version of the future does that mean she has a little bit more um reality there because it's not fixed whereas luciente can't be a physical figure in the past because she's not real she's just visiting whereas connie is kind of stepping out of time and stepping forwards in time to some degree i think that view of it might make a bit more sense i think i'd love to know what you reckon in the comments so that's the timey wimey stuff like i say i don't think it's i've left it till kind of this point because i don't think it's essential for the story and as ever, I'm going to kind of finish on think, talking about things that occur to me during the story. They tend to be what I put in my little notebook as I go through. Um, we've already talked about the first one. Um, we do get this kind of utopia a lot less often. It, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a utopia 
which doesn't have seem to have many flaws. I want you to bear that in mind as we talk about some of these other ones. The next question, um, or the next thing to I want you to be thinking about uh, or give your view on, is the that this future real? There's a very interesting passage at the end, which is um, Consuela and, and Connie's, depending on how you want to talk about her. It's her kind of hospital records where she's described as being schizophrenic. And there's a there's something that we haven't talked about because there just isn't time in this hour. There's a passage where Connie sees herself as different people that are based on the different um, settings she's in, so different roles she's in. She is Consuela, she is Connie. She kind of deliberately describes herself as different people. Is this because she's had a psychic break and she is different people? Does an act of violence lead to a psychic break, which leads to hospitalisation? And one of these personalities that she develops is someone that thinks she's in the future, when what she's really having is a seizure. Marge Piercy very deliberately leaves this slightly unclear. We only see, apart from that final bit, Connie's interpretation. And I think what's quite interesting and what clever is putting those notes at the end, having experienced the doctors in the story, their callousness, their lack of listening and their lack of paying attention to somebody physically, mentally, the treatment of patients as kind of laboratory animals rather than people. You immediately distrust any um, conclusion they've reached about somebody. They've got no idea about Connie's internal world. They All they've got is the external sense of it that she wants to put out there. For me, that suggests that this is real, that utopia is real. She's having this experience. But it is slightly left unsaid. As I said at the beginning, I'm treating it like it all happened. Otherwise, it's not a science fiction, speculative fiction novel for me. It's just a novel. And this is a science fiction, fantasy, and speculative fiction festival. So we're going with it. Um, uh, another thing that occurred to me, or that I was trying to consider, was why Connie? Why go back to Connie? And about halfway through, I made a note in my little um, book to say, why are they? Why are they coming back? Why are they doing this? And about three pages later. I got an answer. I think perhaps Marge realised that this was the point in the novel where she had to start explaining that, um, or I was just very lucky. Why, why Connie? We'll talk about that in a minute. Who else are they going back to speak to? And what are their motivations? We'll start with the why Connie. And Marge Piercy talks about this a little bit. She talks about the um, about wanting to, as we mentioned before, about giving other people the chance to be time travellers that normally had that experience in science fiction stories. So I think that that features in there somewhere. Who else is a more interesting question? I think they mentioned five people um, that they're currently communicating with. We never meet any of the rest of them. As far as we're aware, we don't meet any of the rest of them. And there's no sense, really, if they're all from the same time period. One thing that Luciente explains, or that they explain in the future, is that there are these kind of cruxes of time, these kind of points where things might go one way or the other. And this is she's at one of these. And what they're trying to do, perhaps, is try and make sure that um, try and make sure that the right future is picked so you could read this cynically are the people of the future grooming Connie to kill the doctors or are they just trying to 
and I'll tell you, and the motivation for doing this, I had to think about it, I've thought about this. The motivation is that the stalling of this kind of scientific kind of progress um, means that people will then be ready to rebel when the time is right. They've just got to keep the hope alive. They've got to keep resistance alive for the moment when they can make a change and that their world is the result of everybody being enough people being ready to do something else when the time comes so they might be doing this in a benevolent way they might have just be saying to as many people as they can in the past listen keep the faith do what you do it's all going to be worth it this is what the future looks like but more cynically they could be identifying people linked to specific events like these doctors and their experimental surgery finding the people involved to then say listen not deliberately but you're gonna to have to do something about this barbara Osser, one of the um one of the people that we meet in the future talks about the shape of time and is a shaper and these are people who the debate of the future is about whether genetic programming should be brought into place or not so you there might be some subtle links here which suggest that there's already been an argument which is that um this kind of shaping this deliberate interfering in the past is something that they as a society they need to do and this is all just part of the reality of building the future they want and as much as the utopian people are very open and very warm and very emotional and cooperative there's a hard edge to them as well and the hard edge is something that connie doesn't investigate even though we might want to do if we were there and so let's talk about the ending <clears throat> did connie succeed or fail this is one of the open questions of the story so success might be in this kind of context of crux points and shaping of history shutting down the experiment and just keeping humanity going long enough to eventually make a change or did she fail and by fail she lost her empathy so connie has been through hell and right there at the future she's retained her she's had a moment but she's retained her humanity the connie of most of the story is one who despite being ground down has kept she's got hope for the future she's she's got agency to make a change but um at the end of the novel and she's and she's receptive she's receptive to communication with the future she is you could see her as being a model of humanity on the path to the humanity that we see in that utopia but if that's the case and if what they're trying to do is just um, inspire more people to be like them <clears throat> then she's failed because at the end of the story she's lost her empathy and by losing her empathy has she lost her connection to the future or have they lost interest in her because she's killed the doctors it's confusing and i don't think there's a right or wrong answer um one thing that i did want to point out um which i spotted there is a <clears throat> moment in the story where they talk about the wandering players this kind of festival of um festival of the past where they kind of play act at the, at the past at historical events even though they've kind of got them, got them wrong and one of the Wandering Players productions is called When Time Frayed, and it's set on one of the space stations. Now, do, does this suggest that there's been an incident which has fractured the fabric of space-time, which means that this kind of astral projection can now happen? Was this an experiment gone wrong? Or was this a byproduct of something else? The other thing I noticed is that when they're talking about going back in time, the way that the Connie's friends from the future describe it as, we can't go back and change the past. And the we is italicized. And often um, 
when it's a collective noun and it's italicized in the future, it's because they're talking about um, the people on Earth and the people in space. If they're them, it's an italicized them. So does this one kind of throwaway sentence and that wandering player's script suggest that the kind of the dystopia, the dystopic future, have they been experimenting with time travel so they can go back and change the past? Can and then the way that they've done that means that they can, and all that the empaths, cooperatives on Earth can do is astral project, go back and try and kind of counteract. <clears throat> Which is fascinating to me because if the kind of cyborgs in space who are fighting a war against humanity can go back in time physically to try and change things, that is basically Terminator. So did Marge Piercy invent the idea of Terminator? I'll leave that up to you. I don't think there's a right or right answer. I don't know if she would know the answer. There's just these little hints that you can pull out. So some final things to mention. We are going to go slightly over time. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, this will be edited down to a tight hour, so I won't worry about it too much. Some other little things that occurred. There is a lot of music and poetry in this. I think you can definitely tell that um, Marge Piercy was a poet as well as a writer. There's lots of stories. Um, there's lots of um, music lyrics in here. It's not something I tend to enjoy in stories, um, so I probably haven't spent enough energy unpicking how relevant they are. If you've got theories and ideas on the music poetry, you leave them in the comments because I need educating on that. Secondly, um, there are some brilliant lines in this, some really cool writing. I love this phrase quite, quite early on. Ridiculous to live in a place where the taste of your own soul food was priced beyond you. Now, this is an interesting sentence for me. It's interesting because there's a you can feel Connie's um, annoyance at that. It's something that is even more relevant today than it was then, the appropriation of cultures. But if Marge is sharing Connie's anger for that sense of appropriation of cultures, how can she also model a utopia where there is no soul food anymore? There is nice food, but everybody kind of shares the same kind of blanket culture. I'd love to know what you think about that one. Finally... Um, there's a website called schmoop.com, that's S-C-H-M-O-O-P, two O's there, dot com. They've got a little um, article about the story for kind of book clubs um, and teaching. They've got five questions that I think are interesting to consider. Would the book be different if it were about a man on the edge of time rather than a woman? Or would that undermine the book's point? Um, what would it be like if um, the novel also got into other people's heads and you saw what they were thinking. Is Connie mentally ill? Um, why is the book not in strict chronological order? Why does that matter? And um, what do you think about the language of the future compared to the language of the present? Now, you know, I love to talk about language on these. There just hasn't been time. We're already over an hour and I've not quite finished. I could do a whole video about the futuristic language here. Um, all I will say in this short period of time is that I thought it worked really nicely. I think often futuristic language can jar incredibly. It's a very hard thing to do to create slang. But I think it was close enough to how we speak, but far enough away, but thought through so that everything kind of made sense. I was kind of happy with most of it. There was a couple of things that maybe didn't quite work for me. Um, but considering this novel was written 45 years ago, I think it did a great job of kind of keeping it reasonably outside of a particular historical period. OK, so what I finish is just my um, reflections on the links of this story to other ones. Some have pointed out there's mirroring of structure here for Thomas More's Utopia. That's not a story I know, but the using a futuristic utopia or a fantastical utopia to critique contemporary society, in Thomas More's case, the 17th or the 16th century, 
really I can see how that quite works. Um, there's probably also elements here of um, the time travel stories like H.G. Wells, um, but kind of um, satirizing those with a very different kind of hippie, open your mind way of doing things. There was also not being a big reader of Margaret Atwood, I'm not going to comment on connections with Handmaid's Tale or anything like that. There are three other properties which I think make interesting counterpoints to this. One of which we've covered as part of Cosmia's um, video content before, Future of Another Timeline. Um, the kind of battle for the future, the diverging timelines, um, the kind of radical feminism at the heart of it. Um, they are a really interesting two-piece, these stories. And I, I think if you're going to read this and if you're not, then those two novels, I think, back-to-back -back would make for a fascinating dialogue. It's a similar idea, but done very differently. And I think that was that's something that I can see the debt that Future of Another Timeline has to Woman on the Edge of Time. We also have uh, 12 Monkeys. I think that kind of... Um, mental health and time travel side obviously 12 monkeys is a very different kind of story but i do think there were some interesting connections there and thematically and the final one is not final one is not a genre one um, if you've not i'd highly recommend you read john ronson's psychopath test which talks about the um the ways in which the mental health sector stigmatize people's mental health and try and ca categorise it and um, treat it with medication. And we're, we're living in kind of the end game of what Connie's going through here. Not just treating people as if they're depressed. Not offering people therapy. Just medicating them. Um, and doing the wrong thing. Not treating people who've got mental health issues as people but treating them as um, kind of experiments, essentially. So I think there's a, there's some really interesting things in that non-fiction story that Marge Piercy was also exploring in the 1970s in the system that she's kind of tearing down. So that brings us to an end to an end of this slightly longer book club i hope that's not been too much of a problem for you um we'll be back next month with another story if you want to support the channel if you want to give us a little bit of income to help us pay for our streaming service um, and all the other bits and pieces or just generally support the festival and how it runs there is a link on the screen to our ko-fi you can just leave a small donation there um, that would be really appreciated and it does help us you know pay for all the bits and pieces we need to run this channel um, and to run the festival, which we make as free as we physically can. In the meantime, go and enjoy the sunshine if it's sunny where you are. Make sure to leave comments in this and continue the dialogue about this story. Uh, we'll stay safe and we will see you next time for the next instalment. So for now, see you later.